Welcome to a very crowded room. I'm <laughs> Kathleen Merrigan from the George Washington University Food Institute. I saw several people out in the hallway complaining they couldn't make it in the room. I knew this was going to be a very hot topic, and there are a lot of people who will be watching on the video and joining us today as well. Um, wow, alternative proteins. Uh, it's no longer beef, what's for dinner? There's a lot of things happening, and I have the perfect panel to bring us into this subject matter, and I will certainly reserve time at the end for some of your questions. So be thinking as we hear the presentations today. We had a little call to start out to talk about how we were going to organize, and we decided um, we would start with Ashley, and she'd give us a little background on what our protein needs are, since she comes from the nutrition vantage point. So go yeah, to us. Yeah, great. Story. And I have a slide, so I have some assistance if you want to bring up slide one. Um, and I am a registered dietitian. I've been a dietitian for about 20 years. One of the things that has not changed is nobody wants protein. Nobody wants um, better nutrition. You know, we all want better health. If we have it, we want to keep it. Um, and if we don't have it, we are, uh, in many instances, desperate to get it. But I think it's really important to remind ourselves of that piece because if we really had our druthers, we would probably eat whatever we wanted if we thought that we could have our, our better health from that part. Um, really where our consumer is today, and I invite you all to remind yourself that you are the consumer when, when we're sitting in here today, is that if we pull up slide two, we're in a place of being really confused about how do we actually get that. I use the term infobesity a lot. We've got way more information about nutrition out there. You know, one day there's a study, um, you know, that a third of early deaths could, or a third of deaths could be prevented if we all moved over to a plant-based diet. The next day there's a study or a review that comes out talking about how bad plant proteins are because of the heavy metals in there. And my patients come in and say, you know, should I just go eat a Twinkie, right? So I think we're in that space today. We're very confused. So I thought I would lay the groundwork because, you know, the introduction to this session today um, talks a bit about, you know, the massive amount of mouths and bodies that we need to feed in the year, you know, not just today, but in, in the coming decades. But one of the things that we know and the conversations that have been going on for the last couple of days definitely point out that we're already bankrupted with the current with current health issues. So it's not really a question of can we feed mouths in the future? How much protein do people need in the future? It's really a question of how can we help people get better health? And the way that we get better health is powered by better nutrition. So I'll go ahead and have you pull up the next slide, slide number three, thank you. So better nutrition, really important that we're all working from the same lexicon today. Better nutrition is about giving your body the nutrient resources that it needs today to run better without giving it things that will irritate, overwhelm, and disrupt it. So what we're trying to do, think of your body like a car. We're trying to put the right type of gasoline in there, or oil in the engine, or you know, if, if you're an electric car these days, it's the right electricity on that piece. And the way that that comes down is by giving four things. So when we talk about protein needs, one of the problems that we have today is we have very poor tools, even at the practitioner level, for saying what is somebody's protein needs. If any of you have gone online or gone to a practitioner, they'll say something like take 0.8 and multiply it by times your weight in kilograms, right? Which is a whole other issue for many of us in the States anyway, to just figure out our weight in kilograms. We tend to like it better, but um, figuring that out. But that actually isn't helpful or healthful because that amount of protein isn't what we should be having at one time. It doesn't talk about the quality of the protein. It doesn't talk about the quantity that we're having at one time. If you consume too much protein at one time, which many individuals are in this country, we run into an issue. So um, some of the things we want to talk about today are quantity, quality, how, does the, how do the nutrient balances occur? When we consume wild salmon, we get in different nutrients than maybe when we consume a plant-based uh, burger, right? When we have hemp seeds, I like to call hemp seeds the wild salmon of the plant kingdom, but hemp seeds provide fiber, wild salmon doesn't. So we need to understand those differences. So, the nutrient balance will be important. And then the frequency, are we pit stopping more often to get in protein? That's actually going to be a better recommendation from a health standpoint. So as this conversation unfolds, and sometimes we think that the answer to better nutrition in the future is just more protein, I invite you to remember what better nutrition actually is. It's about that balance, it's about that quantity. And in many instances today, in order to actually help people get better health, we actually need to reduce the amount of protein that they're taking in, but improve the quality. And certainly as we look around the world, the access to better quality, as well as in this country, the access to better quality protein. So I'm really excited to sort of open up because uh, 
everyone that's here today is doing some really exciting things in the space of um, better quality protein and certainly better options into the future. Thank Great. you. Thank you. So we have two innovators, two very exciting companies uh, being represented on this panel. And I'm going to start with Uma from Memphis Meats to describe his product, what, what he's up to. I, I told him in 2012 I gave a commencement address at the LBJ School at the University of Texas, and I talked about test tube meat. What did we think about it? And at that point, it was just on a sketch pad. There was very little out there. And now it's really exciting to see it's becoming reality. So walk us through a little bit about your innovation. Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, my name is Uma Valeri. I'm a cardiologist uh, by training. I trained at the Mayo Clinic. And uh, uh, I have to say, you were, you were an incredible visionary back in 2012 when we started thinking about what was on a sketch pad. Uh, the journey for me started uh, really when I was working on stem cells, injecting them into patients' hearts when they had a heart attack or, or a cardiac arrest to regrow heart muscle. And the idea was, can you grow food from cells? And as I started looking more and more into it, it became pretty clear that there was an enormous amount of work that's been done in this field in the medical science area. But there was also a pretty big gap to bridge to say, how can we think about this into food? Can we start thinking about growing, growing uh, meat from animal cells instead of growing animals? So Memphis Meats is a food technology company that's growing meat, poultry, and seafood from animal cells directly instead of growing the full animal. And you know, when I thought about this innovation, I was like really excited. The thought got into my head about 10 years ago, and I just could not get it out. Uh, and I realized that Winston Churchill talked about this in 1932, saying that instead of growing a full animal, why don't you just grow the parts of the animal that you eat? Um, so the idea was there for a long time. It was waiting to be put together into action. And that's kind of what um, our team has done at Memphis Meats. We initially started off in an academic lab. But then when we started to talk about this and write to uh, uh, one of the venture capitalists in San Francisco, they instantly loved the idea and said, you need to move your team to uh, the Bay Area. So that's kind of how we ended up uh, there in September 2015. And I want to just lay out the big problem. If you go to slide number four, uh, the demand for meat is enormous. It's a trillion dollar market as of now, and it's doubling in the next 30 years. So that requires about 70 billion animals to feed about six and a half to seven billion people now. And if you think this demand is doubling, then we're talking about 150 billion animals on this planet. And, and you think about some of the stats out there, think about calorie conversion. It takes 23 calories of grain to make one calorie of beef. It takes about a third of all fresh water right now. And thinking about that doubling just did not seem sustainable, not even thinking about the environmental effects on the greenhouse gas emissions. So what we propose is a solution that is slightly different than how we get meat to the table now, so that this could also be a choice for the consumer. So if you go to the next slide, uh, I'm going to show you a few bubbles, but if you focus on the left side, everything starts from cells. Animals start from cells. And if you go down the path at the bottom, the cells grow into an animal, and then the animal is slaughtered, and then there's meat that gets into food products. We're proposing changing one step in the process, which is we start from cells, but we're growing these cells outside of an animal. And we have traceable inputs and very familiar things what an animal eat, like you know carbohydrates and proteins, amino acids, vitamins and minerals and oxygen and really monitor the entire growth process and then harvest it when it's ready and cook it into products that we, that we, 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 we love to eat. So I want to show you a few products because you won't believe me until I show you what the products are and that's kind of the frame of reference. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, we first released this uh, in, in 2016. This was our initial product made out of beef, uh, beef meatball. And that captured the imagination of a number of people that this can be done. As we started doing more and more tastings, we also thought about this as a platform where we can bring on multiple species. Because the process of growing the cells into meat essentially is the same in any animal with slight differences in how, how it's done. So last year, if you go to the next slide, this was in March, uh, we released two things. We did two things in poultry, the first time ever where poultry was grown outside of an animal. And this one was duck. And we did duck because duck is one of the most popular uh, uh, proteins in China. 9 billion pounds of protein uh, or duck, much more than the rest of the world combined. And we are showing this so that you can see the texture when it's cut. You can see the fibers. And this is just done on a grill directly. Uh, we had a number of tasters from the Wall Street Journal also come in. And when you are a meat eater and you taste this meat, you immediately recognize this, this as being meat. So uh, we also did the most popular protein in the US. If you go to the next slide, please, uh, fried chicken. So we did southern fried chicken. 
Um, and this was cut to show the texture. You can see the white meat fibers in there that are really giving us the bounciness and the texture that you expect in meat. So one of our goals really is to offer our consumer a choice of picking where meat comes from through a traditional process or the same product but coming through a different process, which we expect to have significant benefits on on human health, on the planet, and also on animal welfare. So it's an important choice to offer. We are still in R&D. There's no product that we're selling. But this is to show the potential of this, uh, of this uh, technology. So Kathleen? Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Exciting. All right. We're going to you, Ethan. You. Tell us about Beyond Meat and what's going on in your company. Sure. So similar to Uma, um, in 2009, I decided to transition out of one career I had, which is in the fuel cell sector. I worked on hydrogen-powered fuel cells for a long time. And the reason I was in that uh, field was around climate. And you know, I began to realize, though, that livestock was the larger driver in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, whether carbon or, or methane. And so I started to look at, you know, could I simultaneously solve for four really critical problems facing the globe by changing the protein at the center of the plate, not telling people not to eat meat, but by producing a piece of plant-based meat and doing it more efficiently than an animal can do. And so if you, if you want to go through the slides, I can walk through this quickly. So, these four issues are really around human health, whether it's you know, looking at diabetes, uh, heart disease, cancer. You look at climate, as I talked about, it's about 51% of greenhouse gas emissions is the most aggressive estimate. Uh, the, the less aggressive, about 18, it's probably somewhere in the middle. Um, and then you look at things like natural resource, amount of water, et cetera. And you look at animal welfare, where there's an increasing number of people that are beginning to think about those issues as they look at the protein at the center of the plate. So what we decided to do, if you go two slides forward, was to question whether uh, you needed to think about meat in terms of its origin. And you know, throughout human history, we've thought about meat, at least in modern history, about 12,000 years forward, we thought about meat as coming from a chicken, cow, or pig. Uh, but if we make a slight shift in our thinking and think about meat in terms of its composition, you can really do some creative things. Because if you think about meat, meat is essentially its amino acids, its lipids, its trace minerals, and its water. That's it. None of those things are exclusive to the animal. So why run them through the animal when you can get them right from plants? So we go to the next slide. What we're doing is essentially sourcing those same inputs, but directly from the plant. And we're running them through heating, cooling, and pressure, and that stitches them into the alignment of muscle or meat. And so we're building that meat directly from plants. Next slide. We have an innovation center here in Los Angeles. We call the Manhattan Beach Project, one, because we're near Manhattan Beach, but two, I wanted to evoke the sense of urgency and scale uh, that we saw in the Second World War with the Manhattan Project. Uh, because this is an area that if we can solve this issue, if we can create a piece of meat that is indistinguishable from its animal protein equivalent, we can solve many of the issues in those four problems I outlined. Next slide. So our entire thesis is not to tell people not to eat meat. I think that's a big mistake. We never participate in meatless Mondays or anything of that nature. What we do do is think about ourselves as enabling people to eat what they love. And so I have children who are 12 and 13. My son particularly has maybe five or six burgers a week, five or six sausages a week that are made from our plant-based meat. I wouldn't allow that if it were 80-20 beef. But I can allow that because I know there's no cholesterol, carcinogens, et cetera. So this is about increasing his protein intake versus decreasing it. It's enabling him to have greater choice. Next slide. So this is a very uh, long line, and this is not giving away product. This is a restaurant that opened uh, with, with uh, serving the Beyond Burger. It was the first uh, advertisement they did. So it just goes on and on. My reason for showing this is to just demonstrate that this is something that people want to work, right? If we can create a piece of meat without using an animal, most people are like, okay, I get that. That's something I would want to do. The thing I'll leave you guys with, you can shut this off and go to the next slide. When we got, <laughs> when, when we got into the meat case, which is where we sell our products. It was really important to me that I sell my product next to animal protein because I wanted the mainstream consumer to be involved in this, right? And I wanted them to go buy it. My number one goal was to not get thrown out. It wasn't very ambitious, right? I want to go in the meat case. We're in 25,000 uh, outlets now. We're 19,000 retailers. We're in about 6,000 food service. In Southern California, in the, in the nation's largest conventional grocer, we are now the number one selling patty in the meat case. So more than 80-20 beef, more than Angus beef, more than grass-fed beef, more than turkey, more than chicken patties. And that's because the consumer is hungry for the solution, and we're working every year to provide it. Thank you. All right, we got the little emerging guys, and we've got the giant here. So, Tom, can you give us the lay of the land on protein as you see it, 
And these guys are not necessarily your competitors, but your colleagues. Explain that. Yeah, it sounds counterintuitive. <laughs> Uh, but I should start by saying, yeah, so I've been, my name's Tom Hayes, I've been the CEO of Tyson for about a year and a half. Um, I came with the Hillshire Brands acquisition, and the company has gone through a lot of change. We're going through a lot of uh, change today, and it didn't start, you know, this last year and a half. Uh, the company was founded in 1935 uh, in Springdale, Arkansas, and has grown to be, you know, the largest food company, not just meat, but food company in the U.S., and we have you know, quite a bis bit of business in other parts of the world as well. Um, we have a mission and we have you know, a different purpose than we have uh, going back to the time the company was founded, but it is in the same roots. Uh, but when I started as CEO, we changed our purpose and that is to continue to raise the expectations for the good that food can do. And because there's a lot of things that are troubling about our industry and uh, the emissions um, that Ethan talked to, of cattle in particular, but also you know just the overall sustainable sustainability uh, challenge in the entire system and the footprint uh, that we have. So our strategy uh, we shifted, and uh, we are now uh, sustainably trying to feed the world with the fastest growing protein brands. And I quickly, you know, realized with the team that that requires us to do three things simultaneously because. Uh, you know, as you know, uh, we talked about these are you know small emerging technologies, but they're also something that is going to be important to the future and going to be growing into big technologies over time. But we have a big system today that needs to be addressed. So the three legs of the stool, as we see it at Tyson, are number one: we have to fix the current system, big system. There are you know 95 percent of people in the U.S. still eat animal-based protein. Uh, so we have to be more sustainable and that can't start, you know, in 10 years from now, it has to start today and we have to, you know, um, work in big and small ways to get that uh, done. The second thing is uh, then alternative uh, forms of protein. And to answer the question, you know, about why, uh, we are actively trying to disrupt ourselves and partner with those technologies we think are the best technologies that could provide sustainable solutions. Uh, Beyond Meat and Memphis Meats are our choices, and we've, so we've made an investment in those two companies. Um, it's uh, about the technology, but it's also about the two gentlemen that you heard speak. I mean, they're incredible um, leaders and founders, and I think they're going to have a huge impact. So we are uh, doing that very proactively through so our Tyson Ventures uh, Fund. The last thing is I uh, just want to touch on is consumer education and just education of the public in general. Um, these uh, gentlemen are defining that science is a good thing and it can be you know, something that's going to be really helpful for us to build you know, better solutions for a sustainable world. And there's a lot of you know, sort of skepticism about you know, is science going to be helpful or harmful. And I think we need to embrace the fact that technology is really good, uh, can help and be eyes wide open to every bit of the science to make sure that we don't go um, down a wrong path. But we have, uh, you know, everybody probably here has heard so much about GMOs and how they may be uh, in some uses wrong. But if you think of a world without GMO seed corn to make, you know, plants uh, in corn, we would have probably double the acres to be planted around the world. So it's just uh, the last leg that we like to talk about because it does require some education. And I'm super thrilled to be partnered uh, with these two uh, gentlemen and uh, their colleagues. And you know, we're looking to do our fair share to um, you know, come up the curve on sustainability. So I'm going to start with you with a question here. Yeah. You know the expression, between a rock and a hard place? Yeah. yeah. So are you potentially between <laughs> yes. the meat case uh, and the traditional industry? You heard Ethan say, it was really important in his vision and his company to be in that meat case side by side as an alternative. And yet we know now that we have the, the U.S. Cattlemen's Association putting forward a petition to USDA saying, you know, meat is meat and we challenge these kind of uh, new models and the way the terminology is being used. H how should we be thinking about that? Yes, yeah, probably is a rock and a hard place, but I would say that also um, they're good people trying to do the right things and they're protective of their industry and their business for sure. Um, but I think as it relates to how things get named, I mean, there's 
the government will decide that. It's not something I'm going to weigh in on <laughs> and necessarily uh, you know, get uh, involved in that. What I will say is that when we have discussions with cattlemen, we let them know that we are focused on sustainability. And right now, we have a long way to go in terms of making that system sustainable. So there's a lot of efforts that we have at Tyson. There's many things going on with uh, a movement called Progressive Beef in our company. And so it's a longer journey, um, potentially. But if you think about you know, where we're going together, I don't know when they're going to sort of merge into a platform that'll be sort of simultaneously scaled as sustainable. Um, we have a lot of work yet to do, I think, probably, uh, Uma would say, on Memphis Meats. And we've got we to accelerate and, and move faster. But yeah, it does put us in a uh, bit of a tough spot, and but that's okay. Um, leaders are never going to be sort of you know in this easy place where <laughs> everything just sort of falls into place, and you don't have to uh, get into the debate. And uh, I do speak to our cattlemen, our hog farmers, and you know our chicken farmers, and they ask questions about why. And for uh, everybody in our company, as well as our partners, we talk about choice uh, that we need to have a consumer choice, and it's not a this or that, it's a yes and. We want to make sure that we're, we're giving consumers choice. And that uh, we're not going to be in a position, I'm not going to lead a company that's going to have a Kodak moment <laughs> where if we get, you know, we sort of all of a sudden find ourselves, you know, sort of staring in the mirror like, what, why didn't we address this? We have to, you know, or do we owe it to our shareholders, we owe it to ourselves to be progressive and to be, you know, moving uh, forward with the right solutions. It is tough, though. For sure. It is tough. Yeah. So, actually, you're dealing a lot with consumers and yeah. their questions. Do you think that there is that capacity to understand the variations in that meat case? Yeah. And once again, I invite everyone in the room to remember that we are all consumers, right? So um, I think we definitely understand. Um, I started off my career working in advertising and sold sugared cereal to America and told people it was good for them. So I understand the transition of you know how, how we need uh, education um, and to allow ourselves along that timeline. I think some of it is also around the vernacular of saying things like even alternative protein or alternative meat. So what we have to remember is that um, plants are, do provide uh, protein. They provide the amino acids that any animal, uh, we ourselves, are, humans are animals, uh, create and build into protein. So I think that you know, helping people, you know, w if the cattlemen are talking about meat is defined in a certain way, that's actually not truthful. What we are talking about is the human body needing protein. There isn't a human body need for meat. And so I think you know, having that conversation with them and thoughtfully being able to say, we want to help you create the better quality meat so that you're still, that product is still available. Um, and there are great innovations that are coming along. Uh, you know, we're talking here about finished products. I think some of the stuff that consumers are excited about is the transparency and what are animals actually being fed or how are they being treated medically and you know some of that. So I think the mistake that we make as we move forward is if we speak down to said consumer um, or if we propose that there is one option uh, that would be out there. And really, when you look at the emissions piece, and one of the conversations we were having earlier is, I'm more concerned about us exporting unhealthy meat consumption and meat practices globally because of the implications of what that means to our health back here from a, you know, from a carbon emission standpoint and that piece. So we happen to also need clean air and need clean water and not just need protein. And so I think that we really do, you know, inviting the consumer along to say there are wonderful solutions. I like to use the expression better, not perfect when it comes to health and uh, when it comes to nutrition. So I think if we talk down, that's a problem. I also think that engaging the consumers, anyone here who's on social media who wants to talk about the farm bill and reminding everyone that that really is the opportunity for us, that really is our health care bill. You know, that's the investment in saying all of these things can be part of in, in the future and not just investing in money going to corn and soy, um, you know, in the same ways that it's happened in the past. So you mentioned globally those in, in, in all the different studies we look at, we see that as economies develop, the increase of meat consumption goes mm -hmm. along with that. And when you look at the implications for the planet over time, it's really very, well, frightening is, is the soft word for it. It's, it's devastating, really. And so I'm wondering, personally, you know, I think about certain developing countries, particularly in Africa, where 
there weren't landlines in the homes for telephones. Mm -hmm. And they just sort of skipped over and went right to cell phones. Do we see that potential in these alternative mm -hmm. proteins? So, so mm -hmm. I'll start with our card cardiologists yeah. here. <laughs> We talked about the, that you were really looking at duck because that's the emerging you know, market with China and people want duck. But what are you thinking about globally how a product like yours and Ethan's carries on? I think that there's a couple of ways of looking at it. One is I think any product that a consumer touches or feels uh, uh, is when the decisions get made. And for us to get in front of a consumer as quick as possible is important because Everything we've done so far, the magic really happens when someone comes and tastes it. And that's when they recognize that, okay, this is meat. I mean, plain and simple. I think getting that in front of people that they're related to their local cultures and being able to do that in a way that we're respecting their traditions of how they you know, cook and eat their meat. Because when, when you put Memphis meats on a grill, it looks, tastes, and cooks like meat. And giving them the opportunity to do it in their own traditions, I think, is our first goal as a company. The, the second thing I would say is uh, there is, like T Tom was saying, there's a lot of information that has to be given to the consumer. And that's the reason why we as a startup, although we don't have a product on the market, actively are going out and talking about it every place we can so that we recognize that transparency is enormously important. And any time we talk to you know, people across the spectrum of ages, there is an enormous uptick of people wanting to have an option like ours. And the industry has you know, evolved very much from where it used to be 20 years ago, and the whole field is now called either clean meat or cultured meat. So those are the two terms that are being used in, in, in common vernacular. And getting that out to every, every, every part of the country and the world is our job. The reason we picked duck is because we know this is a global platform, and we have to show that we can do any, any animal that has gone into the meat supply chain locally, and that if we can really scale this up as a technology, we're not trying to seek or, or trying to replace conventional agriculture. We're talking about this as another solution that's an and solution. And really think in long term, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 to 50 years from now, how are you going to get meat to the table in the way that consumer is really used to? And you know, I'm looking at medicine. Really, medicine has evolved in the last 100 years with enormous technological progress. But the true in innovators and inventors have always been you know, food producers or farmers. They've always embraced technology. Tradition has never stayed as frozen you know, 200 years ago or 500 years ago. Tradition has always been dynamic and moving. And we're thinking about this as the future tradition. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when the uh, you know, US cattlemen have a petition out there, we're, we're respectfully submitting comments to the USDA asking them to deny it for a couple of reasons. One is, look, you know, meat and beef are integral to you know, human race. And being able to bring it as a product to the table is enormously important. And the production methods have always changed. You know, the production methods that we're using now were not the same 20 or 50 years ago. So we have to be able to be open to the fact that a company like Memphis Meats is stimulating an enormous amount of uh, interest and passion from the future generation of farmers. And when is the last time you, you had people applying from all walks of life to say, we want to come and work at your company because we want to be food producers? And I think that's one part we don't want anyone to miss. And the second thing really is, um, you know, this is an enormous market. It's doubling in size. There's a lot of room for everyone to grow, and getting out there is, is important for us. Well, in fact, before the panel, uh, Uma and Ethan were saying, we don't fight. We're like all, um, we're moving together in the same direction, chasing after common, you know, common goals. So, uh, Ethan, you gave us some stats. Mm -hmm. You're doing some pretty great things in terms of market penetration here in the U.S., but do you have global, global plans? We do have global ambition. In fact, we're going to be in the Australian market, in, in the mm. EU, uh, and, and other, other places uh, globally. We're in Hong Kong now. Um, but I want to touch a little bit on the cattlemen's thing, um, because I, I think there is, you know, it's a shame, I think, that, that, that they're taking this position, although I understand it. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time as a child uh, around agriculture. Uh, in fact, as an older teen, I lived on an Angus ranch. And so I, I get the culture. I understand the threat that they feel. But it's misplaced. Um, you know, what we're proposing is to create a dramatic efficiency in American agriculture that I think would be similar to the efficiencies we saw when the combine was introduced in the beginning of the 20th century. Because what we're doing is we're saying grow protein in the fields for human consumption, not for the animal's consumption. And by doing that, you will make more money. And so I have an open door policy uh, at our company that any cattleman who wants to come talk, and that actually happens. We've had folks in from New Zealand and Tyson, you guys have helped us connect with people. 
Um, because you know there will be some winners and losers, but there'll be far more winners if we can do this together. Because we can literally start to get out of the commodity process that's going on in American agriculture today, where people are growing corn, soy, and wheat at very low prices to feed to an animal, into one where they're growing regional crops that are protein rich that we can use in our process. So that was the first comment. Second is, you know, I wanted to applaud Tom and Tyson. You know, they don't have to do what they're doing. I mean, they still. I was talking about our revenue to him uh, as we walked in, and you know, he's a polite man, so he didn't sort of say anything. But by the time I was done telling him what our revenue was, he's like, "Well, we just earned that." <laughs> <You know? laughs> so they're doing fine. The beef industry is doing fine. You know, I, I think um, you know what you see is leadership here, and you know whether it's Tyson and, and Tyson Ventures and Tom's own work, or I see Power Planet were there. And people are getting in this early because there's a real opportunity for us to. To, re, to reshape American agriculture together. And so I hate the adversarial nature of it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not the way we should be thinking about this. We should be working together. You know, I was on the phone with Texas A&M uh, recently trying to go through what crops we could grow on marginal lands. And marginal lands are three things. It's too dry, it's too wet, it's a chemical imbalance, right? So you can grow crops on each of those lands. You just define the right crops. And maybe there's some extreme you can't, right? But then you can separate that protein from that crop, and then you can give it to us and we'll put it in our system. So there'll be very few losers and a lot of winners if we make this conversion. So, yeah, can I just add that? Sure. One of the things that uh, the, uh, I had a chance to talk to uh, Paul Hawken. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many of you have read, uh, read the book Drawdown. And he talks about uh, using the leverage that you know, cooperation creates in order to make things better versus the adversarial nature of things and you know however you want to slice it we have a challenge and he says look the problem is well defined <laughs> we don't need anybody else to like further define the problem what we need is you know people that are going to actually you know get in the game and help solve it and i just wanted to build on you know what ethan said because that is to me a very uh, powerful concept and i just uh, totally embrace it well, I think it's so important from the health standpoint, um, people are failing, right? They're, they're investing time, money, effort, and trying to get that better health. And when they're not getting the results, they're turning to the cardiologist, they're turning to me and saying, I've tried all this stuff, it's not working for me. So there are going to be different options that need to be available for different people. And I think, you know, the, the cattleman's piece, the dairy across the board, these are, um, these, there are, there's a desperation of they don't see their vision into the future. So as a company that's talking to them directly, I think that part is great. But I think we have such a desperation at the healthcare level, which is crippling our country from a, not just from a um, financial standpoint, but from a potential to be competitive in the future, from a potential to have healthy individuals get into our military. So we have to have all of these different solutions available. Um, I can't turn around to someone who wants to have a meat burger and tell them that they have to have a plant burger. But if the plant burger tastes great, that's going to be an entry point for me to turn around and say, and I, I loved what you were saying, Ethan, is you know, my, if my son wants to have this five days of the week, I no longer have to be the person that says, well, you absolutely can't, right? And one of the issues we have not solved is you know, maybe here, if we walk down the street, you could get an amazing quality burger, but the majority of school burgers are not anything that I can be saying to somebody, this should be part of your diet on a consistent basis. So I'm, as much as I'm excited about, you know, the opportunity for us to go into a restaurant, what I see with these companies is we need to leapfrog into hospital food and into, um, <laughs> schools into prisons and get better better quality food there and to military you know what we're sending our military off to eat and so i think we need these solutions we need the companies like tyson's that can accelerate us and many of the others uh, that can accelerate us quickly to have those healthier options um, for for all of these reasons so let me ask all of you um we sometimes hear that some of these new alternatives are um dealing with taste challenges because we have a particular historic tongue for, for certain uh, meats uh, with, with sodium, um, and some of them are higher in sodium. Is that something that you're battling in your innovations to try to bring down these sodium levels to hit that you know, perfect health product that people are seeking for your son to eat at five, ten so, times a so week, no, I don't know. Yeah, Ethan, no. what are your thoughts? So the sausage we just released, for example, I'm really proud of because it has, for example, less sodium than, than a, let's take a, a Johnsonville sausage, for example. Um, it has more protein, right? It has a combination of um, proteins from mung bean, rice, um, uh, peas, 
Um, and so it's enormously healthy. Um, sausage is a great thing because you can make it taste so great. We have a hot Italian, which is completely indistinguishable, you know, and there's, but we're on a journey. I mean, we've been at this 10 years, you know, the, the evolution of the animal is obviously something that's over, you know, hundreds of not, you know, longer millions of years. Um, so we're getting closer and closer every year and our target is not moving, right? I mean, beef tastes like it's gonna taste, right? And so we start to collapse the differences. There are over a thousand molecules that make meat taste like meat. And what we're doing is isolating those molecules and finding the analogous ones in plants or even the same ones and then putting them into our product. And so there absolutely will be a day when it tastes exactly the same. It's close today. I'm not gonna lie, I mean, if you had a deliciously done Angus burger right now, you'd say that tastes really good and ours is probably you know, good, but not as good, but it's getting every day, it's getting closer and closer. The product we have in our lab today is much better than the product on the shelf, and that's part of a commitment we have at Beyond Meat to something we call Beyond Meat Rapid and Relentless Innovation. We want to make obsolete the products on the shelf as soon as we can, mm -hmm. and so we've done that, and we're going to be releasing new products this year that will, will prove that point. And Tom, that goes to Tyson. So you have this venture fund. You're not the only big guy in town with a venture fund. Cargill, mm -hmm. others, over $10 billion last year in the U.S. in, in venture capital in food. Um, he can innovate faster than you, perhaps. Uh, great challenge. I'm really yeah. giving you the, the really love questions here well, on the panel today, am I not? Being, you know, <laughs> hey, I'll just say that being a big company has, the, has that challenge. I mean, moving slow is um, you know, something we constantly fight, but I would say we're becoming much more agile, too. Some of the things we've learned from you know uh, companies like Ethan's and Umo's is that when small teams have the ability to think big and get the capital to support it, they can achieve huge dreams. And so we created, as a result, an innovation lab. And it's a small uh, corner of an office that we have in Chicago. And there are seven people that work on the team. And their job is to get brand new foods to the market in six months that taste great and help solve the problem of food waste. They use uh, spent grains mixed with a little chicken and some other things to create you know, new products. Uh, one brand new one that's coming out is called Yapa, which that word is derived from, you know, in the Andes, there's the farmer's market. When they have something left over, a slightly more, they give it away. And that, that uh, wasted foods is called Yapa. And so that's what we learned because we know that if we just put it in our engine, for sure, um, our stage gate process would bring, you know, <laughs> These, these gentlemen to tears <laughs> with us, well, that might work. And we got to get that faster, too. But I would say that you know, challenging ourselves for the innovation lab has been very helpful. And is your innovation lab, when you get the big picture on protein, are you also thinking insect protein, perhaps feed for chickens? Sure, we thought about Feed for people, yeah. who knows? You know, what's interesting is if, if you think about crickets, mm -hmm. they are uh, high in protein, but per 100 grams, not as high as chicken. And so, and interestingly, the water usage is about the same. So you're like, well, I don't know. I don't know if crickets is the right answer. But we are, we are looking at, we are looking at everything, and uh, it is, it is a very fascinating space. Uh, lots of solutions are going to need to be on the table if we're going to make progress. Part part of the benefit of working with Tyson is that they do their innovation center in, in Springdale is pretty amazing, and so I love going there um, because you know as much as we move very quickly. These guys know how to make meat taste great, and uh, they've been doing it for a really long time. Um, so I think it's, you talked about the power of collaboration, you know, bringing you know, the, the, what we can do and bringing what, what Tyson can do together um, through an investment is really important and impactful. And so, just to add to that, mm -hmm. Kathleen, you asked about taste, and we are, we are very finely tuned beings over the last thousands of years where I think our palate is probably the best sensor in the world that can sense what meat is and what isn't meat. And one of the advantages we've seen with, uh, with with Memphis meats is when we are growing these animal cells and the final product is animal cells, we don't really have to tinker a lot with taste. It is, you know, taste, we feel very comfortable that it's, it's there already. The things you're working on is texture because texture is other part of meat. Depending on what cut or what type of product is, there's enormous amounts of products with different textures. That's where most of our work is focused on right now. And we are 100% we are uh, comfortable saying that there's no problems with taste, but texture, there's a lot of opportunity for us. And the second thing I also want to say is, if you can pull up slide eight, if it's possible, um, I believe that is. It may take them a while. Uh, the next slide, please. Maybe this is the one. Um, no investor is going to put money without tasting, right? So we had to be sure that when we brought investors in, we had to 
for the first time ever for any food company, we said we're going to build a big tent. We want to have people that represent the population in the world, where we had financial investors who saw the enormous economic opportunity of being able to bring meat to the table in this process. So we had financial investors like DFJ and Atomico. We also went to impact investors who cared about sustainability, water, land, and also animal welfare. And we, ha we had them come and taste the product. Then we had Gates and Branson and their teams join, and Kimball Musk's team. And then, then we went to meat industry incumbents, Tyson and Cargill, and said, look, you guys know meat better than anyone in the world. We want your best chefs to come and taste our product and then decide. And that's kind of what happened. They bought their, you know, their, their, their culinary teams, and they came and did the tastings. And you know, it's been incredible to get everybody under the same tent to say, look, this is a solution for everyone you know, globally, that if we can bring meat to the plate without asking someone to give up a choice that they've had for thousands of years, it's definitely a win-win for everyone. I think getting that message across has been very helpful. So I'll ask one last question, and then it will be your turn. So Ethan, for you, really, um, you heard Uma talk about clean meat. That's mm -hmm. one way people are referring to this. It's really interesting, though, because when we look out across the food landscape, one of the big trends is is away from processed food. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got to be fewer ingredients, less processed, fresh, say fresh, that's hot, hot, hot word these days. And yet, in some ways, your burgers, your meat, is going in the other direction. Are you thinking about that? Are you thinking about how you message that? Sure, sure, that's a great question. We do get it a lot. Um, and I like it because I love our process. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's been done in the meat industry over the last uh, decade around getting to know the farmer that's growing the product, et cetera. And we can do the exact same thing. So we can pinpoint the farmer that's growing the peas that are in our product or the mung bean, et cetera, tell that story around them. We explain that this, this protein is going through really three simple steps, heating, cooling, and pressure. There's a documentary filmmaker that's doing something uh, where we're, we're in it, and I have to go and, and watch the entire process of an animal being harvested, basically. And then the owner of that facility comes to our place and watches our process. So it's important to keep in the front of your mind that there's always a process, and it's a question of which process you're more comfortable with. Great. And I think the other part to the consumer side of it is explaining to somebody what they're actually getting. So it brings us back to at the end of the day, we really do have to give the body the nutrient resources it needs. So to not, so these guys are setting super high expectations and meeting them for um, deliciousness and texture, which is good because better nutrition better be delicious or we're not going to keep at it. You know, we're going to go find something else. But th to set the expectation that a burger um, that an animal burger is going to give you the same nutrients that a plant burger is, is going to be a mistake. And so I think that we've kind of, maybe Veggie 1.0 was calling everything the un, you know, the unchicken, the unmeat, that kind of a thing. And what we've realized is, and I have to do a lot of work when I have uh, clients come in explaining to them that they have to actually understand what it is that they're taking in. So the amazing part about taking in that burger is you can get fiber, you can get in, um, you know, the coconut oil, or if you have algae in there, you're getting in essential fat fatty acids, you can get in these different nutrients that with a, a burger, you might have to top it differently or do something, you know, you wouldn't be getting that part in. So I think, you know, the we've seen it in the non-dairy uh, milk space, and I think we're definitely going to see it in this space, which is you have to just be really clear about what your particular product delivers and not have it compare. You're not comparing chicken and cow here. You're really just talking about, we have an awesome burger for you, and here's what it's going to deliver nutritionally. <coughs> So unbelievable resource people here on this panel who would like to ask the first question. We are passing the mic around, this yeah. gentleman right here. So if you can just wait for the mic because people are listening on video. Besides the benefits of the carbon footprint and nutrition, can you talk at all about what you think will happen to pricing? In mm -hmm. other words, will it be cheaper uh, for people to consume protein? I don't know how you pronounce or pound or sure. broiler or however you guys define that. Yeah, sure. So, so um, Uma and I share a couple of common investors, and one of them is Gates, and, and Gates invested in our company in 2012, and he gave us two pieces of advice. Um, he said uh, to go international as quick as you can, which we're trying to do, and second was to drop the price of the product below meat as soon as we could. Um, and you know, you, I sort of scratched my head, why is our product more expensive than meat? That makes no sense. If you believe all the things, we put up one of the last slides I had, uh, if you believe all the things I'm saying, that you know, taking the animal out, the animal's inefficient, all these other things, you know, we should be dramatically cheaper. We're not, right? And the reason for that is, is the scale of the supply chain. So you know, if you did a map of the United States and looked at all the slaughterhouses, there'd be a lot. 
right? You look at the map of the United States and look at all the separation facilities, which is how we get our protein, there'd be very, very, very few, right? A lot of our stuff is done in Europe uh, and in Saskatchewan and, and, and Canada. So it's the lack of availability of those resources that keeps our pricing high. As soon as those come into the market, there's no material obstacle to us dropping the price below meat. And I think things get really interesting then, particularly in Asia and India and, and elsewhere. Anyone else on that? I'm just going to mention one thing. I've been a part of a several-year effort, but it's a UNEP initiative, United Nations Environment Program, called TEAB AgriFood, and a big report coming out in May, and it's really trying to come up with a common framework for putting a value to externalities in food production. It's involved nearly 200 scholars across the globe. And so part of that pricing, too, is what's really at the, at the ticket that you're paying at retail and, and what's not. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Yeah, um, Dave Heber, UCLA. I was just going to bring up the point that, you know, maybe the standard for the beef that we're going to produce, and we brought this up on Sunday afternoon as well, should be the original meat that humans ate, which was all grass-fed animals. And uh, when you look at the content of the fat in those animals, it's lower, it's higher in omega-3, it hits a lot of the health issues that you mentioned. And it's really the traditional meat that we ate. And you have an opportunity when you're starting from scratch to do that. And the other point I want to bring up to Tyson was the issue of uh, regenerative agriculture, where you take care of the microbiome of the soil as well as the microbiome that's in our bodies. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity here with a clean slate to hit the taste, but also to hit a number of health impacts that we've never been able to hit yeah. before. I'm interested in your comments on that. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's, you know, for. Um, all ideas are worth, you know, considering, and I, I think the interesting thing is, you know, talking about the soil and doing the full supply chain, you know, analysis. Um, I think that's what you're talking about is, you know, what is the cost overall, whether it's uh, you know money out of your wallet or cost to the environment, and we are uh, taking that very seriously. We just uh, introduced this past year um, the uh, an initiative which will be a commitment to make sustainable uh, regenerative agriculture out of two million acres, which that would be about the amount that we need to feed our entire uh, chicken supply chain. And so uh, it's not easy to figure out how to do that. There's a lot of nutrient management that goes into it. But as it relates to grass-fed, I think you know that becomes, I mean, it's very popular all, all over the world, but it's uh, because of the abundant grain, right, in the U.S., we've, we've sort of become, you know, just uh, from a taste perspective, you know, really, really focused on and then by the way a lot of people that come to the US from <laughs> other countries like the like the corn finished you know beef as well but apps I think all ideas are you know worth considering that can contribute Spices, I would say, is the other yeah. big thing because when we're talking about salt we, you need the you need the mic mm. in order to okay so <laughs> the, the point was also don't forget yeah. spices yes yeah, in the back yeah. please yeah, hi Peter Bryant. Yeah, I was just wondering about yeah the, the elephant in the room or juxtaposition I guess is yeah, all the animal activist information that's being flooded in the web about cruelty you know in the supply chain with you know, traditional methods not just in the US all around the world um, how does that play into this how do you respond to that because you know the, there's a lot of noise in the system about it right you know, both from Tyson's perspective but also from alternatives all right, well, why don't we driving the market? start with Tom and then go to Uma, because even though it's test tube meat, so to speak, it's a cell, it still is uh, from the animal. So let's get yeah. both of them to respond. So I didn't, I didn't hear the first part of the question. Well, it's really just a juxtaposition. You know, you have, you know, there's diet issues, but there's also a lot of activism on the web, you know, on animal cruelty in the supply chain, Yeah. not just in the U.S. So how do you, how do you deal with that? Because a lot of people are going off meat for those reasons, yeah, not sure. just diet reasons, right? Uh, so same, same answer, we have to do better. You know, we own any of our supply chain issues that we have. We don't raise cattle, we don't raise hogs, but for a small amount, we do uh, contract raising birds and we have strict standards that we uh, put in place. And we have people that don't meet those standards uh, occasionally. I would say it's getting a lot less than um, before we started down this path. Um, absolutely, I think that, you know, the animal welfare part of this is not small. And we, you know, uh, do raise animals for food, um, and that's not anything that we're hiding from. But to the extent that um, 
you know, they should have a good experience. They should have one bad day in their lives is the way that we think about it. But that's the, uh, that is absolutely something we got to continue to make, you know, uh, forefront for everybody that is in our supply chain. Uh, you know, there's a point to it um, as well that is uh, we have a real problem with access to food in this country um, and around the world. And so one of the components that is incredibly cruel is somebody not having quality access to quality nutrition. So there is no dispute that the best thing for any human body is a plant-based diet, but that that's not plant monogamous, right? That means that we know that we need to get certain nutrients from plants and we need to do that consistently. Um, but we also, if we are wanting to help people get towards a better plant-based diet, we still need to meet their nutrient needs today. So I think the improvement, and that's really been happening, of how can we treat animals better throughout this process, until which time we have companies like Beyond Meat and some of these others where we're able to create global access to plant-based proteins that are high quality, we also have to be careful about just focusing on animal cruelty and not focusing judging one, you know, does a human being have access to, and I know you're not in defense of it, but it's it's one that I wrestle with a lot because I, I work with a lot of people who don't have access to just good quality food. You know, I can tell you based nutrients. on a couple of experiences that when we're talking about animal welfare and, mm. and people love eating meat, they immediately see this as what, I don't have to give up eating meat, but you can still have animal-based meat. Uh, so we think about this as raising cells, animal cells, uh, and I think that's enormously important to address the issue you're talking about. In the long term, we see people, if they have an option to choose meat that came to the table through the process of slaughter or meat that came to the table without the process of slaughter, we believe they'll absolutely make the switch. But I also want to touch on what Ethan said, you know, growing the supply chains to be able to scale to that kind of production is going to take a long time. So there's multiple generations of farmers that can also continue to look at this and say, hey, will I be able to tell my, my kids and my grandkids that we were in support of an innovation that was all going to help us get to a place we want to be? Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the big picture. And secondly, to answer David, your question, the innovation cycles we can talk about, for us to do the whole process of taking the first cell and actually harvesting and cooking it can take anywhere from three to six weeks. And if you think about that for animals, it takes anywhere from three years to seven years to change breeds and selectively breed and do you know, you know, gene editing, let's say. The, the, rap, the rapidity of our cycles is enormously fast, and we can get you know, the profiles you're talking about, whether it's grass-fed or corn-fed or go back to you know, bison meat profile. Um, we feel like the next generation of our products can also start addressing some of the, the, the health benefits that we can try to think about in, in growing of meat. Okay, I have a question right here in the front row. We need the mic. I have the oh, okay. <laughs> After Lance, then the front row. Go ahead. So uh, one of the one of the challenges with producing lots of animals is the use of antibiotics and because that fuels the growth of drug-resistant bacteria that can spread to us and cause drug-resistant infections. And Tyson's actually been a, a major leader on this issue in recent years and, and uh, it's been really inspiring to see what you've done on poultry. And I just wonder what your, what's your vision for the future in terms of pork and beef, in terms of getting rid of those antibiotics and uh, you know, producing a safer product. Sure, yeah. Um, let me start with on uh, the poultry supply chain. It was really hard to get to where we, we wound up, and that's uh, the team that was focused on that has been doing, you know, incremental steps uh, year after year after year. You have to run an incredibly clean operation to do it. And we just said uh, about two years ago, let's press to go the final mile and get it done because uh, antimicrobial resistance is an issue that we want to solve. And there's not antibiotics in chicken that you would receive, you know, even from companies that use it in the, the process in the, in, the, in the finished goods. But we thought, you know, as an overall um, uh, issue for us to be a part of, we wanted to get it out of our system on poultry. It is more difficult, you know, as we talk about hogs and, and cattle just because of the life cycle. Um, however, we also offer products that we are trying to get behind to, to grow in terms of sales. The brand for anybody that wants to buy is called Open Prairie. Mm -hmm. So Open Prairie Natural is uh, no antibiotics, uh, natural pork and beef. And those are um, items we're trying to continue to get behind, as well as working with you know, farmers to continue to develop technologies that allow them to uh, take antibiotics out of the system. So it's a, it's a harder problem to solve. Anybody that wants to help us, you know, get there to solve it, happy to, happy to, uh, you know, get your get your help. Great. Okay, right here. 
Hi. Um, so my question is also for Tyson, and uh, it's specifically about ag-gag. And for those of you in the room who may not be familiar with the ag-gag, I only learned about it this year. There are many states in the United States where it's a federal f crime to take photos or video inside of a meat production facility. And my question is, one, how, how does Tyson explain to the consumer the benefits of the ag gag? Why is it good for me that I can't know what happens in the facilities where a, a substantial percentage of the food comes from? And secondly, um, is Tyson taking any sort of progressive stand on that particular issue, trying to make it more transparent? You know, you said you, you have people from the meat industry, they can come in and meet with you. It doesn't seem so open on the other side. Um, we have had, I'd say two things. One, we've had people that have uh, bad intentions come into our operations and trying to do things that are, you know, incredibly disruptive. And if you have good intentions, you want to help us, you know, solve problems, we're happy to do that. We've had a number of transparency campaigns that we're launching where you can come into uh, a farm and see actually what happens. Uh, we don't own the farms that supply us, uh, but we are looking to do a number of different things, video monitoring, and we're constantly looking. Ag gag, I don't know that uh, we would be aligned with that if I don't, uh, if we haven't heard that term come up a lot in the, you know, uh, our setting, but uh, we are more and more transparent. We believe that that is absolutely necessary and we have to continue to move it back up the system because that's what consumers want, that's what they expect. Let me just say, you mentioned the federal crime. It, th those are state laws, state by state. You see a checkerboard of, of laws that have to do with, with um, what people can do in plants and, and defamation efforts. Anyhow, I want the last question to be about one of these innovations, if I could, and this gentleman right here in the second row, if I could get the mic to him. Thank you. Actually, about innovation, so thank you. First and foremost, congratulations. I, I'm very impressed with everything I've heard here today. We've helped a lot of different food industries get rid of preservatives in the food so that the food is natural, and we put it in the packaging so you get barriers so that it still has shelf life but we don't have to eat it. It's in the package instead of in the food. Mm. My question to you guys, you're doing all this effort. Uh, what are you guys doing in terms of keeping out preservatives and chemicals out of the food? It's very easy nowadays to do with the right packaging. What are you guys doing so that you can have a shelf life, especially if you're going to start exporting, you're going to go to different places where the logistics is complex and I don't know, there's not refrigeration or that you need more days. Bottom line is, take the preservatives out of the food and put it in the packaging. Are you guys looking into any of this? Yeah, we're absolutely looking at that. Again, we're not on the market, so I'm going to let Ethan talk about how it is to be want. on the market. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, we got it. Uh, it actually works great. But here's a couple of things I want to point out. What we do is we take, um, you know, we take conventional meat, organic, and also our meat, and just put it on bacteriologic plates and let it grow out for a week, actually 24 hours, 48 hours a week, a month, and see what's growing. And because in the process itself, there's like very few chances where contamination can get, it, get in. Uh, we don't see bacterial growth or bacterial colonies, whether you think about Salmonella or E. coli. And I think that does two things. One is the food itself can be, I think, significantly lower in, anti, anti, uh, in, in bacterial load, which, which requires minimally, uh, minimal use of antibiotics, if at all. But the second thing it does all, also is many other times when you have preservatives in meat, it is to de decrease the log counts of bacteria. Mm -hmm. And we think that because mm -hmm. this innovation doesn't really require us to have uh, the risk of contamination, we think the need for actually having preservatives is dramatically lower. So we are very excited about that. I think the supply chain uh, uh, implications of that are enormous. The cold chain implications of that are enormous because we leave this at, at room temperature and we're still not seeing the bacterial growth. Okay. So Ethan, last word, please. So, so um, Don Thompson, who is the former CEO of McDonald's, is on our board, and, and his wife and, and Don and myself were all friends. And, and several years ago, I was going on and on about our innovation and, and the lab and all the great stuff we're doing. And, and Liz Thompson stopped me and said, you know, innovation is great for my iPhone, but I don't want to put it in my mouth. <laughs> and I just love that quote because, you know, all the amazing innovation we're doing at the end of the day, mom has to be comfortable putting on the table, pretty much, right? And so we're very careful to keep out things that are hard to understand, uh, that maybe are genetically modified, et cetera. So, um, preservatives and, and, and things of that ilk would fall under that uh, with us. Now, the trade-off is 
around packaging, and our packaging for our burger is not the most environmentally friendly stuff, and I can't stand that, right? It's actually not good, right? It's, it's only recyclable in some communities, et cetera. But if we were to switch from the map gas trays we use now to one that is maybe less robust, there'd be degradation of the product because we've kept some preservatives out. So it's the thing I try to teach at the company is you can only serve so many masters, right? And I try to serve only one. And my goal, yeah, okay, <laughs> okay, there you go. All right. All right. Well, <laughs> if you would very uh, give hearty applause to this great panel, thank you.